This is the story of Kenyan Airlines Flight 431. On the 30th of January 2000, a Kenyan Airlines Airbus A310 was to make the flight from Abidjan on the Ivory Coast to Jomo Kenyatta International Airport in Kenya. The plane had 169 passengers and 10 crew members on board. Here's the thing though, this plane should not be here right now. The crew had diverted here because the weather at Lagos was just so bad. The pilots held over Lagos for about 30 minutes and then diverted to Abidjan. So a relief crew took over the airplane and departure was scheduled for 9 p.m. At 8.55 p.m., the pilots were in contact with the controllers and permission to start up was given. The crew were hard at work, going through the checklist, and the captain said, Flex 60. This was to do with the engine power setting on takeoff. Then the two engines came online, and the ground mechanic said, We have two normal startups. And then the plane was cleared to taxi. As they taxied, the captain ordered the first officer to set the flaps to 15 degrees. The first officer was the pilot flying and the captain was the supervising pilot. As the plane began to taxi, the controller updated them on the wind and the conditions at the airport and cleared them to take off. The controller asked the pilots to call the tower back when they reached 4,000 feet. By 9.08 p.m., they were done with everything and the first officer said, takeoff checklist completed, cleared for takeoff. Then, once the plane was lined up, the captain applied power to the engines and nine seconds later, the plane was at 100 knots. Seconds later, the captain said, V1, rotate. The pilots were committed to this takeoff, and the plane took off. As the plane gained altitude, the first officer said, positive rate of climb, gear up. Two seconds after that, the stall warning sounded. The plane was low to the ground, and it was just picking up speed. This was the worst time for them to be getting a stall warning. The autopilot then called out 300 feet. They were just 300 feet off the ground. The first officer asked, what's the problem? As he did that, the autopilot said 200, 100. It was counting down their altitude. The plane then started with a whoop whoop pull up alarm or the EGPWS warning. But the first officer silenced the alarm. By this point, they were just 50 feet above the ground. The captain kept urging the first officer, go up, go up. The plane then made an automated call out for 10 feet. The voice recorder then picked up the sound of impact. Flight 431 had crashed into the waters off the coast of Abidjan. By 9.10 p.m., the controller knew that something had gone seriously wrong and activated the crash alarm. The Air Force was immediately out there searching for the plane. The wreck of the plane was not hard to find as the plane had gone down so close to the airport at Abidjan. Due to the proximity of the crash site to the airport, getting the flight data recorders was not really that hard and listening to the CVR told the investigators that the stall warning went off in the cockpit right before the plane crashed. Now, the question is why? They had a few theories. It could be that the plane was misconfigured for takeoff. Mandela Airlines Flight 091, anyone? It could be that the airspeed fed to the computers were faulty. It could be that the engines lost power or that they retracted the slats way too early. It could also be that there was a sudden change in the center of gravity of the plane or a deployment of the spoilers. In reality, to get to the truth, they needed to dig a lot deeper. Now, one of the things that they listened for on the CVR was the takeoff configuration alarm. As the name suggests, the alarm is meant to alert the pilots to a misconfigured plane on takeoff. If the pilots did retract the flaps on takeoff, then the CVR would have picked up the misconfiguration alarm. But there was no alarm. The wreck of the plane also showed that the flaps and slats were in the exact right place where they needed to be. So a flap slash slats issue did not bring this plane down. They then wanted to know if the pilots were being told incorrect airspeed by their instruments. They knew how much the A310 weighed on takeoff, so they checked to see if the callouts made by the pilots made any sense. Like, would the plane be going 100 knots when the 100 knots callout was actually made by the pilots during the takeoff run? They did the math and it checked out. The information that the pilots were seeing was accurate. Their instruments did not deceive them. The CVR also told them that the engines were at a high power setting all throughout the short flight. Had one or both of the engines spooled down, you would have been able to hear that on the CVR. But that wasn't the case. These engines were at max power. Well, not max power, but at 97% of their power. More than enough to take off and climb out. So they ran simulations to see if a movement in the cargo section could have caused a very quick center of gravity change. But the way that the plane acted did not point towards that. 
so the investigators just kept digging. Maybe it was an uncommanded spoiler deployment? Nope. They heard nothing of the sort on the CBR. An uncommanded spoiler deployment, maybe? Underwater video of the cockpit and the spoilers themselves sank that theory. One by one, they were beginning to clear out each of the supposed causes of this crash. Nothing stuck except for one theory, a false alarm. What if the stall warning that they got was not a real one, meaning that they were in no real danger? They were right. It was a false alarm. The investigators were not sure how the false warning got generated, but they assumed that it had something to do with the airplane speed calculation system, the angle of attack system, or the stall warning generation system. But here's the thing. Even a real stall should not have brought down this plane. Pilots are taught how to deal with a stall warning this close to the ground. This flight should not have ended in a crash. In this case, the pilot should have commanded toga or takeoff slash go around thrust and reduced their pitch till the stick shaker alarm stopped. In the event of a real stall, this would allow the plane to gain some speed, thereby avoiding a stall. The pilots were even told on how to deal with a false warning. They just had to pull a few circuit breakers. So that begs the question, what did the pilots do in the case of Flight 431? Flight 431 never even reached an altitude of 400 feet. And when the warning hit, the first officer did reduce the pitch of the plane. The plane was making radio altimeter callouts, so we know that the first officer didn't really ease up on the nose down input. The thing is, in the takeoff configuration, even a slight nose down input can make the plane descend. Now at this point, the first officer is doing exactly what his training is telling him to do. He's reducing pitch, allowing the plane to pick up some speed. But the problem is that he didn't stop with the nose down commands. In his mind, he'd put the nose down a bit and the plane would pick up some speed and that would cause the warning to stop. But it did not in this case because this was a false warning. So he kept the nose down a bit because the stall warning just wasn't stopping. It should also be noted that the stall recovery procedure was only partially applied as the engines were never pushed to toga. So why didn't the first officer or captain realize that the stall warning was fake? Let's look at what all they had at their disposal to figure out that this was a false warning. The pilots had accurate speed information on their primary displays, and they had accurate engine readings, and they had accurate speed trends on their primary flight displays. The investigators concluded that with this information, they should have been able to deduce that the stall warning was a false alarm. But even with this, the pilots did not realize that the plane was headed towards the ocean. This is partially because the pilots never heard the GPWS whoop whoop pull up alarm because the plane had an internal priority system for alarms and the stall warning took priority. So they never really heard the GPWS warning that might have saved their life. On top of that, it was pitch black outside and the sea did not have a whole lot of lights on it. So it was very hard for the first officer to orient himself in 3D space. Now, all of this is well and good, but what about the captain? Why didn't he intervene in the cockpit and save the plane? The thing is, the captain realized what was happening to the plane. He knew that the plane was descending. That's why he said, go up. But he realized that way too late. All of this came down to the stress that both the pilots were under caused by the fake warning. A stall warning on takeoff is very, very rare, and no one really expected that. Had they been more prepared for an unexpected eventuality, then Flight 431 might have made it safely to its destination. But alas, that was not meant to be. Due to Kenyan Airlines Flight 431, the agency made it clear that training on how to recover from an unexpected stall warning and training to detect false stall warnings be implemented into the curriculum of pilots and into their recurrent training. Thanks to crashes like these, flying is a lot more safer today. We really did learn a lot from our mistakes. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.